Hey, uh, how's it going, DEF CON? Uh, super excited to, to get to talk to you guys about uh, one of these things I'm passionate about, uh, which just happens to be uh, security and magic. Um, uh, today, we're going to be going over uh, out forces and equivocates, uh, a treatise on how magicians speak. Uh, I learned that word all by myself, too. I'm very proud of it. Um, <laughs> but uh, let's go ahead and get started here. Um, so uh, starting off, uh, I'm Hex90, uh, no op, not OX90, whatever you want to call me. I don't really care. Uh, I'm a magician. Uh, I'm also a full-time software engineer. I have a background in security, uh, love to break things. Um, and most importantly, I don't need more than my uh, current 200 Twitter followers. So <laughs> no need for any handles or anything. Uh, but overall, uh, a fairly unremarkable uh, person. And <laughs> you don't need to worry about it. Um, what this talk is, um, I, I want to I wanna cover uh, three major tenets within uh, magic, specifically how we we handle choices and how we handle uh, making people feel like they're making choices, but ultimately it's either something in our decision, uh, in our favor or something that we want to happen. Um, so we're gonna be covering uh, forcing, multiple outs and equivocates. Uh, the interesting thing about these three techniques is that they're all like super similar, uh, but they do have some small key differences that make them worth talking about as an individual concept. Um, going forward, uh, what this talk is, is not going to be, uh, I, I don't want to feel like I'm, uh, have people, I'm giving them permission to heckle performers. Uh, performing is extremely difficult. And, uh, and honestly, if you have an interest in magic, uh, the time to do it is not during uh, a performance or a show. Uh, honestly, a lot of magicians are, are pretty down to earth people. Uh, they're just people who, who are, are just as nerdy as, as you or I, just kind of just doing a thing that they love. So if you have an interest, honestly, take a magician aside, say, hey, I think that's really cool and I, I wanna try it. And uh, they'll more often than not uh, give you some cool books or some tips on, on how to get into magic. And I, and I think that's really awesome because we're a really open community, uh, but uh, please, please don't harass them because you know how to do some stuff now. Um, also, this talk isn't uh, about any secretly documented human cheat codes uh, to make people act in ways that they normally wouldn't. You're not going to get someone to act in their, against their interests by saying some uh, magic words or like hit some crazy synapses that are going to make them uh, all of a sudden forget who they are. Uh, this is all very real, uh, well-published, at least in the magic world, techniques that present the illusion of choice. Uh, while you remain completely in control. Um, I also want to take a moment to address the fact that uh, we have, uh, I am not in control of the slideshow right now. So I'll be saying next slide. And I'm sorry, it's not the most beautiful thing in the world, but I don't have a clicky thing. Um, so I won't be able to do that. And also uh, quarantine has made it so this week has been the most human interaction I've had to deal with in like six months. So I, uh, I'm, I apologize if I sound less than human, um, but let's go ahead and, and hit the, the first, first term. Uh, so forces, uh, essentially a force is the appearance of different values to be chosen, but through subterfuge, the only option is a single choice. Um, this is when other choices cannot be selected. This is, I have 52 cards and I really, really need someone to pick a specific thing. Um, it, it's when you have no option but the, the, the primary choice that you want them to select. Uh, can we go to the next slide? Uh, a super over the heads term. And honestly, next time you have an opportunity to do a coin flip, uh, go ahead and try to say this, but uh, tails I win, heads you lose. It's uh, very quickly, if you read it, uh, it it's easy to see how how obvious that is, um, but ultimately this is a force. There's no other option but to have them pick a wrong choice here. And um, if you actually try this and you, you have confidence in your language, uh, you'd be surprised with how many times you can actually get away with this. It's uh, pretty fun. 
uh, especially if you need to settle any bets within a bar. Uh, the next slide, uh, we have multiple outs. Um, this is the appearance of free choice, but ultimately all the possibilities, uh, all the possible decisions are accounted for and expected. Um, this is used when you need a freedom of choice and they need to actually feel like they have a free choice, like everything is, is fully free. Um, and, and the reason why you wanna do this is just uh, sometimes when you're forcing someone to pick a specific thing, unless that force is perfect and it's designed for the situation, you can, you can start to pick up on it. You can kind of detect something in your brain goes off and says, I'm being told to do something that I might not want to do. And, and there's an instant fight response. But if you feel, if the pressure is no longer on the decision and it's on the response, uh, then you can get a little more into this. Um, and if we go to the, the next slide, um, Penn and Teller uh, a while ago, they, they had the perfect example of multiple outs. Uh, they had a special uh, called Penn and Teller off the deep end. And um, to give you an idea of like how long ago this was, uh, Aaron Carter was also on this special uh, and he sang a song underwater. Um, while they did magic tricks uh, with scuba diving, as well as a bunch of other stuff on the on the beach. But one of the effects that they did was they had 52 re reveals, which is sewing a playing card into your jacket, hiding a giant card in a pot of plants, uh, you know, kids having them written on them in sunscreen. It was, they had 52 different values that they could potentially reveal. And essentially they had someone selecting a completely random card and naming it, and then suddenly they knew where it was, or they, they knew how to, to reveal it, and it made it seem like this was the only option that could have happened, because who would really set up 52 possible answers for this? And I, I think what they did was a, a perfect example to show the idea of what a multiple out is. Uh, next slide. Uh, equivocate. Uh, equivocate essentially just means double entendre. I think it sounds cooler, um, but ultimately you're using open-ended questions and vague language to create ambiguity around choice or knowledge. And I'm seeing that there's a typo in this slide and I'm kicking myself, but I love it. Uh, you also use it when you need to control the perception of information, um, even having different definitions between different people. Um, for then in magic, this is called uh, dual reality. Uh, this allows you to have the same sentence based on the context that two people are coming from, view it differently. Uh, and I feel like the equivocate is probably the one, the, one of the most powerful terms when it comes to controlling uh, decisions coming from people, as well as it's the most applicable to social engineering. Um, and it's actually one of the one of the many reasons why magicians won't perform a trick twice, uh, very similar to multiple outs. Uh, everyone's heard the one of the rules of magic is you never perform a trick twice, and equivocates and multiple outs are a part of that. If you do the same effect, but you have to go a different direction and someone's seeing it twice in a row, uh, they're going to easily be able to pick up that there's uh, two different paths that they possibly could have gone down, and it kind of uh, does damage to the effect, as well as if you view magic uh, like a joke. You wouldn't say the same joke twice in a row because everyone knows what the punchline is going to be and it becomes uh, substantially less special. Uh, but the example for equivocate, uh, if we go to the next slide, is uh, are you right-handed or, or left-handed? And if they respond left, then you say, great, I need this hand to be loose, so let's use your non-dominant hand because we want them to be using their right hand. Um, but alternatively, if they would have said right and you go to the next slide, uh, are you right-handed or left-handed? And they say, right. Uh, then you say, great, I need this hand to be strong. So let's go ahead and, and use your dominant hand. And if you notice here, if you saw these questions side by side and they're answered the same way, uh, that would ruin this effect. But because of the vague language and the lack of intent being posed in the question, you can't actually tell uh, what the reasoning is for the question. And so the answer doesn't seem so alien, but it is a little bit when you, when you set them side by side. 
Uh, let's go ahead and go to the next section. Um, so how do these terms work? How, how come people don't instantly call uh, bull on a lot, lot of this? And ultimately, it's, uh, it's not voodoo. Uh, there's no real magic here. Uh, you're simply taking advantage of people's laziness. Um, there's a, a book actually called The Paradox of Choice, Why More is Less. And uh, that was written by Barry Schwartz. And in it, he talks about uh, the decision-making process that people have. And it's primarily about consumerism. But also in the book, it shows that, uh, that people are less happy with their choices when there are too many. And often they'll take a lot longer to make a simple choice. Uh, so people much prefer to choose from three flavors of candy versus 50. Because if they pick from 50, they're always going to be semi-disappointed. Um, and the perfect example of this is anyone that's had to coordinate, especially now with Zoom calls, uh, coordinate a time with multiple people. Uh, anytime you ask, hey, what time works for everyone? Because you want to be a decent human being and you want to accommodate everyone, uh, you're gonna, it's going to result in a conversational gridlock. And this is because you have a, a, an infinite amount of times that could be selected. I, I can't imagine people are like, oh, yes, I want to be at 12 p.m. and 16 picoseconds, but in theory, you could. Um, and instead, if you say, hey, should we meet at 10 a.m. or 6 p.m. instead of what time works for everyone, uh, more often than not, you're going to get an answer much quicker. Everyone's going to be able to come to a decision quicker. It won't always be exactly the times that you requested, but people will come, uh, they, they will coalesce into a, a, a single time a lot faster because they're able to take that information and they pose it as a question to themselves as how does this apply to me and how can I fit into this instead of also trying to account for all these external factors. And by limiting choices, uh, you make people uh, feel more confident in their choices uh, instead of uh, making it this open-ended uh, world. And, and uh, another issue with with using equivocate or using multiple outs or even forces is that some of these methods can leave a trail of word crumbs uh, that you can easily backtrack to figure out that there was manipulation. So if you were to watch, rewatch a Zoom call where an equivocate was used, you could potentially figure out how vague that language is after the fact. Uh, sometimes in the moment, you won't necessarily see that happening but after the fact, you might be able to, to, to backtrack on it. Um, but in that moment, you also want to avoid people being able to find and pick up on those word crumbs and backtrack on that conversation. And the way magicians get around this is uh, we create little memory snapshots. So let's say we had to do a deck switch and do all these other crazy things. Instead of highlighting that moment of the deck switch, we're gonna to try to mentally uh, have the picture that your mind takes, the thing that you remember be much different. Uh, that's also why people, magicians at least, they'll work on blocking out their props. Uh, so for example, we had a magician who came on and he did a Zoom show and part of it is he, he has a card under a box and he wants you to make sure that you see that, that card and you remember it and you remember that it didn't move. And, and that's very important. Because when you go back in your inferring method, you don't want to have your, your audience uh, get distracted on that. Um, and the way we do this is we reiterate on stories that we wanted to happen, not necessarily what exactly happened, but what we want to happen. Uh, and then we also let the manipulations fade into the background. We stop drawing attention to them. Uh, I, if I'm doing an effect where I need to choose someone's right hand or left hand, I'm not going to go back and say, and remember when I had you pick your hand, we're going to pretend like that never happened. Um, and an, another misconception here is that, uh, misdirection is used, but it's not used in the way people think about it. A lot of people think misdirection is, Hey, look over there. And then something sneaky happens over here. What actually happens with misdirection is you, you have something that you want to hide. You want this to be in the shadows, not in the light. So you make something interesting happen over here instead. And your focus comes here. And then this thing, it, it, it drops away into the background. 
And you can do this verbally. You can do it with props. You can do it with stage direction. Uh, if you've ever watched live theater before, uh, even without magic, you'll notice when there's a monologue or something happens and they're bringing everyone to the front of the theater, things in the background start vanishing and they're pulling objects off of the stage. Maybe cast members are disappearing because they're changing out a set piece or something. But that's not because they're trying to misdirect you. They're not trying to fool you. They're simply encouraging you to keep your attention elsewhere, but they don't have to do it with a, a trick or like a, hey, look over here and ring a bunch of keys in your face. Uh, and, and that's a very important thing when it comes to making that snapshot, because if you're really aggressive with that, you will fail. And that's how people can kind of backtrack, whether it's in a magic trick or whether you're doing this in, uh, in a social engineering setting. Uh, if you could go ahead and hit the, the next slide. Um, so now let's get into actual applications of, of these three concepts. So uh, magical applications of forces. Uh, obviously, there's there's a card force. So if I have, uh, let's say a duplicate of a card somewhere and maybe it's in my pocket or something. And I want, I want to do this really seamless effect where I have a card selected and then it goes back in the deck. And then without bringing my hand near it, I can pull it out of my pocket. That's a very uh, simple way, but there's, there's many ways to force a card. Uh, one of the, the classic of all forces is exactly that's the classic force. And it's the idea of, of, of timing it in such a way that when they go, that they naturally select it. Um, and this is something that takes decades of practice and it's something that I continuously am working on. Uh, there's also methods of sleight of hand for, for forcing a card. Um, and and there, there are books and books and books written on this subject uh, for actually learning this. And if you guys are interested, uh, I'm happy to, to show a, a few methods later after the Q and A is going on. Um, there's also a, a billet or an object force. So this is one that I think actually applies more to, that could be used better for social engineering uh, or uh, inoffensive attack. But a billet is essentially a, a folded piece of paper uh, that might have like a piece of information on it. And commonly, if you need to force something, you might allow your audience to collect and write a bunch of things down and they get put into a box but maybe that whole box gets switched out or maybe there's a special gimmick with the box that allows when you open it, you can go in and you're only gonna pull out the ones that you want. And that's really important to, to take notice of because you can do this with pieces of paper, you can do it with small objects. Um, and of course the last one here is a, a pattern force. Uh, this was um, less about swapping out an object that you're providing and more about uh, swapping out information that a, a spectator is providing for you. So let's say we have someone who mixes up a Rubik's cube behind their back. They're unaware of what that information might be. And then they bring it forward to you without looking at it. And you're able to put something like a shell over it or uh, something that allows you to change the values in it to something that you want to get to a specific value. And essentially in real life, if you think about it, this would be like if someone was able to generate a random value that they weren't able to look at and then they gave it to you and you said, ah, yes, your random value is three. Of course it is. Um, and, th and that could be very damaging. Uh, I can only imagine the type of nonsense that could happen with crypto and that. Um, if we could go to the next slide. Uh, some IRL applications of forces. Um, so this, there's a, there's a, a bunch of different ideas and you can get as cheeky as you want. Um, and I, I just came up with a few. Uh, these are of course uh, theoretical. I'm coming from a magic perspective, but I also like to break things. So I haven't actually had an opportunity to, uh, to do any red teaming myself, um, but I have done lots of uh, security contracting with uh, black box and, and white box penetration tests. And a lot of these concepts could easily apply and leak in to a, a social engineering concept because they do work so well in magic. Um, but when you're comparing forces in magic to forces in real life, uh, the, I realize that forces are best used for getting objects in people's hands, thinking that they have chosen them from a group, that, that this is, is the object that's in their best intention. Um, like imagine going to a used car lot and for some reason they want you to take this specific car you're like, I want this model and you have three of them 
and they're all the same color, but why do you want me to have this one? And of course that should throw some red flags, but there, there might be reasons for wanting to do that. It might be advantageous for them to get it off a lot for whatever reason. It might not, it might even be benign, but you never know. Um, and some other applications of, of forces, uh, for example, if you wanted to, if you had a batch of benign uh, USB sticks, and then you had a batch of USB sticks that had, for example, uh, a human interface device attack on it, uh, something that's going to simulate a keyboard and, and open up the terminal, and it's going to uh, do lots of terrible stuff. I've, I've written plenty of them. Uh, if, if you ever get into hit attacks, they're, they're a lot of fun. Um, but if you only want a specific person to get them, imagine if you're able to be a vendor at a party or you're able to pose as a vendor at a party and everyone's getting their things and you could do some sort of grab bag switch, uh, which are is super common in magic. Uh, they, they look very benign, but it basically makes it so certain people can choose from one compartment and another person can only choose from a specific compartment. Um, and it's, it's a great way to get people to select a specific uh, object. Um, also, rigging a contest. Um, if you think about something like the lottery, uh, the whole lottery is based around uh, making sure that you can't force the value of, of, the, of the ping pong ball. I don't know if they still do that, but uh, if you're able to force that value or force the object of it, that is, that's all uh, game over, uh, really. Um, another example is if you could easily, easily with using like a cross-site scripting exploit on a website, you could change all of the link values on a website and, and point it towards malicious software. And uh, of course, you know, you can point it to a, a phishing website, you can point it to a piece of software, malware, whatever you want. Um, but of course, you're, you're taking this environment of open choices. They think that they can go anywhere but of course you're forcing them into a funnel. They're forcing them to a single choice. Um, and then for a, a social net, uh, engineering application, uh, if you had, for example, a small directory of people, all with different phone numbers and names, and these are all your teammates. Well, if you get caught in attack or someone wants to verify your credentials, and instead of saying, here's my boss, go, cut, go ahead and call him, you're like, here's my team. I don't have time to deal with this because uh, now you're putting weight on them. But you're like, I don't have time to deal with this. Go, go ahead and call one of them and they'll verify. Well, they're ultimately going to end up with the same person. But uh, that illusion of choice, it, it makes it seem it, there's a, a legitimacy behind quantity. Because um, if, I, if I was a vendor and it's, it's the difference between going into to a place and handing out like a handful of of uh, flash drives from a baggie and then having a box of 2000 of them. You know, one of them you're gonna go, oh, okay, that guy's clearly handing out viruses. And another one you're gonna go, oh, maybe, you know, who's gonna create 2000 pieces of malicious hardware? I mean, I might, that, that sounds like a great attack actually. Um, expensive, but it could be useful. Um, if we could go ahead and get to the next slide. Uh, and the magic applications of multiple apps. Um, there, there's a couple of, there's, there's hundreds of tricks. There's thousands. You can find these in, in books everywhere. But uh, I, I actually came up with a small little bar bet for this. And the idea is pretty simple. It's you play a game of rock, paper, scissors. And uh, the, the proposition is, I am going to win this game of rock, paper, scissors on the first round. And ultimately, whatever you do, you just pick rock. So if they go rock, paper, scissors, and this person picks rock. Well, the idea is you can say, I told you I was gonna win on the first round and that's why I chose paper. And all you do is you have a piece of paper in your hand uh, because they chose rock. Now let's say they went ahead and they chose scissors. Of course you win because it's rock. And if they went ahead and they chose paper to cover you, unfortunately on your paper, you do have uh, a scissors. I don't know if that's, that can make it out, but it's essentially you understand the constraints of where you're in, they have three choices to pick from. And of course it's a con and you're more likely gonna get punched than uh, rewarded, but maybe you'll get a good laugh out of it. Uh, and, but the idea is that you, you see the constraints where they have three choices and you're able to account to every single one of them and make it work in your favor, even if it is gonna get you punched in the face. 
Uh, another one, uh, this is a classic effect. There's a, it's a queen's holdout. So if you were to have four queens, what you can do is there's a, you can get these sleeve garters. Uh, you can even do it with a rolled cuff, but essentially you put these queens in your sleeve garter, they're pinned to your arm and you spread them like so. And I'll put them in a specific order. Uh, it's called chaste order. It's uh, clubs, hearts, spades, and diamonds. And all you do is you have these on your sleeve pinned and in an effect, you can have a queen freely named and claim it's in your pocket. And when you open up your jacket, instead of reaching into the pocket, you reach into the sleeve and you can feel the index and easily pull out whatever specific queen it is, deposit it in your pocket as you're opening up your body language a little more, revealing the queen. And of course, the, the first thing that's gonna happen is people are gonna say, there's more than one queen in there. So you can easily empty that pocket completely then they might imply that you have a queen in each pocket and you were just going to change pockets, uh, which you can also easily disprove. And this is a good example of an out because they feel like everything is clean. Everything's happening into a single location, but you've been able to determine that there are four choices. They all have to, one of them has to end up here and you know a way to account with, uh, for all of them, uh, whether it's through verbiage or it's through uh, a physical manipulation, albeit this one is uh, very simple. Um, and then this is a classic, classic in magic is, uh, name, you have them name any card and you, you aren't ready for the one they named. Um, often what I'll do is I will stack my deck, uh, but not in, in all 52 kind of way. I will do something like a queen of hearts on top and like a jack of spades on the bottom. And then maybe in my pocket, I might have an ace of spades and, I just have a mental catalog of what cards get named the most. Um, usually one of those, uh, sometimes like a king of clubs might get thrown in there and it depends on the person really. Um, but if I'm ready with that queen of hearts on top and I have something that can blow someone's mind if I, if I have them name a card that I know is on the top of a deck, then if they name it, great. If they name one of the other cards in a diff different position, I work with that. But if they don't name anything, it's not like there's this massive failure. You don't know what my intention was. If you went ahead and you named the nine of spades, then I just go ahead and go, okay, well, we'll use your free selected card. This is the one you were thinking about. Now let's work with this. There's, there's no force in there. There's nothing that can make them go, oh, that was weird. It's just, I'm having you select a card. You don't know what's about to happen. And that's something that happens a lot in magic is this concept of don't run when, when no one is chasing you. And I feel like social engineering can really uh, uh, gather a lot from that because um, when, you're, when you're nervous, when you are trying to make excuses for everything, when something doesn't work exactly how you want it, uh, it that's when things fall apart. Um, you know, people, people are weird. <laughs> people are just inherently weird and, and take advantage of that. So no one is a mind reader. No one can see exactly what you're about to do. Don't, don't run when you're not being chased. Uh, let's go ahead and, and get to the next section. Uh, this is the IRL application of multiple apps. Um, originally, I, I said this as a joke, uh, but Batman is the master of multiple outs, even the Adam West one. Uh, and if you see here, uh, he has both, he's clearly being attacked by uh, a shark, um, but he, he's ready because he knows, he's like, I'm going to be attacked by manta ray repellent, <laughs> by manta rays, or I'm going to be attacked by a shark. And so he has repellents for both. And if both of those don't work, then he has fists. Batman is the ult, he is, he is the king of multiple outs. He is always ready for different scenarios, whether it's Joker toxins or maybe just throwing someone off a building. Who cares? He's Batman. Uh, but in, in actual real life, uh, if you go to the next slide, the, uh, the IRL applications of multiple outs, um, a really good example that I've, uh, that I've used when I've done um, phishing attacks on, on jobs is uh, multi-layer phishing attacks. More often than not, a phishing attack is, here's my website, I want someone to go to it and I want them to get tricked into going in and I want them to, to try to type in their information and I want them to send it to me and I wanna log it. No, uh, phishing attacks need to get way more sophisticated. Uh, and, and through multiple outs, you could, you could easily do that. The, so if you think about it, um, 
you know, you, you need to figure out what are all your constraints and how can you have an outcome that, that serves you the best. So if you take uh, phishing websites, for example, uh, think about the outcomes. Uh, one, they leave immediately. Two, they type in their info, then they read the URL at the last second and then they leave. Uh, or three, they fall for it completely and then they send you your information. Uh, all of those, like the, the only one that wins is the very last case. But if you, if you think about it, what if you actually, when they type in their info, you have a JavaScript key logger that is taking note of everything they're sending and it's sending it off to uh, a command server every time. Anytime you make a phishing website, put a key logger on it because I, I have gone onto websites plenty of times. I start typing my username and password and then the oh shit moment hits and then I read the URL, realize I'm fine and then I keep going. But if there was a key logger on that, I'd be fucked. You know? No, that, 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 would, that would not be okay. Um, and then also another way to, to serve yourself a little bit better, um, if someone leaves immediately, instead of letting them just leave immediately, why not attempt to have a JavaScript pop-up that uses uh, some identifiable trademark language or a company name information from your target? And it says, hey, we just detected that this is a phishing website. Uh, go ahead and fill in this form with your name or your email or your phone and your extension. Get privileged information. You might not get credentials, but privileged information is also gold. Not everyone has an easy to access company directory where you can start futzing around and getting stuff like this. Uh, you can even have, when they try to leave a JavaScript pop-up that says, great job, this is an internal test from the company. You passed our security audit. Congratulations, fill in this form so we can make sure that your manager knows. Boom, taking advantage of, of that desire to build and, and feel good about themselves, you've, you've given them more. And all of these options are way better than it either works or it doesn't. Uh, and then of course, there's the option that they might be able to realize that there's a scam within the scam. And you, know, you can go as many layers deep as you want with this. You can even follow up with an email afterwards and be like, hey, we noticed this and like try to contact them directly. But ultimately those three layers are better than the original one. And an example of doing this in the physical world is, uh, is think about like crash key sets, like where you have uh, keys for all of the, the entry boxes in, in Los Angeles or all of the, the elevator keys. There have been so many DEF CON talks. There are so many keys available. Everyone, everyone's aware of these. Uh, there's also the TSA key pack. Oh, bless the TSA. They have made this so easy. They took the constraint of everyone in, the, in an airport has to have a bag with a lock that fits this constraint. So how, what, what type of outs do you need to have to make sure you can manage everything in this constraint? The TSA key pack. You, you get a copy of each one of those keys and Suddenly, you have an out for every single lock. And, and this works, of course, for, for other different systems. Uh, and you can just kind of view that exercise of like, think about challenges in a security scenario where you say, what are the constraints? How many choices are there? What are all the permutations of this? And how many can I realistically have a response to? And then how many can you do if you're being unrealistic? Maybe it takes having... 400 different ISP uniforms in a van. Screw it. If it gets you in the building, it gets you in the building. Um, basically, any plan B attacks or additional layers uh, in, in real life, that, that makes for a good uh, multiple out. Uh, can we get the next slide? Uh, so stage whispers. Um, this is actually something that's used in both magic and also just on stage. Uh, normally, a stage whisper on stage is just like you're communicating a direction that the audience isn't supposed to know about it. Like people, you can have full conversations on stage uh, depending on the size of where you're at. Um, but in magic, a stage whisper is you call up an audience member. You don't, you don't make a fanfare or anything. You bring them up. And while you're bringing them up, you look them in the eyes, you're helping them up and you say, what is your name? But you don't say it loudly. You don't move your mouth a whole lot. You don't articulate. They say, I'm John, and you pull them up and you do a magic trick, you do whatever, maybe it's a mentalism piece, and 
and you're doing your mentalism piece and then you say, and your name is John and everyone loses their mind when they nod because you've, you've just figured out their name. And then you quickly have to like hush them because you're like, no, this isn't, this isn't where the magic begins. I am more magical than this. And to John, it just looks like you're telling them, oh no, that wasn't actually magic. But this is an example of a dual reality. This is where the audience thinks one very specific thing and John is aware of a completely different thing. But the thing is, is that you don't want John to, to be in on it. You, you want him to, to be an unwilling participant. And you're doing this with an ambiguity of language. You're doing this with an ambiguity of knowledge. Um, another effect, and this is a classic thing, you have a box set aside, you have a watch, a knife, and a card. And on the card, it simply says, I have the card, you have the knife, the watch is in the box. It's very simple. Uh, and you place these objects, you let your audience members shuffle them around, your, your person that you're doing this is great for one-on-one, -on -one. and you say, put both hands on any two of these objects. The box is set aside, it's not part of this. And let's say they put their hands on, on, the, on the knife and the card. And you know, you go ahead and you say, okay, hand one of those to me and you take one, leaving the watch on the table and you go ahead and just put it in the box. If they get the card, you say, read what the card says. And then they read it out loud and all of the qualifications for it are true. If you end up with the card, you simply read it out loud and all the qualifications are true because it's from your perspective. The only instance where it gets a little weird is if they put both of their hands on the watch and one of the other objects. But you say, okay, now go ahead and lift up one of your hands. And if they lift up the hand uh, that's on the knife, you can go ahead and say, okay, we'll set these aside. We'll set these two objects aside. And then the watch, I want you to put that in the box. If they lift their hand off of the watch, you say, okay, we'll discard the watch. And this gets back into the idea of uh, you don't want to do the same trick twice because this is a perfect example of if someone watches us twice, it's instantly going to fall apart. But if you can present this well and you can present your equivocate well and your method for it and your language and your confidence in it and how much you believe what you say is happening is happening, it becomes the truth. It's no longer optional. It is the truth. And that's, and that's why magic uh, magicians like Aaron Brown are so effective because when he speaks, it's the truth. And, and, that's, and that's absolutely wonderful. Um, and then another effect is called ash in hand. Uh, earlier, I did a slide where I asked if someone's right-handed or left-handed and it didn't matter. The reason for this is for an effect called ash in hand. What you do is you have someone put both of their hands out flat like this. And all you do is you grab their hand and you adjust them a little bit like this. You maybe move it lower or higher. You give some bullshit stage direction. And what you're doing is you're secretly depositing a little bit of ash on your finger onto their left hand. You can do it on their right, it doesn't really matter, uh, but you're gonna force one of those hands with an equivocate. And so let's say you put it on their, on their right. So you smudge it on their right hand and their hands are all like this, you've moved them, they now have the smudge. You are now completely hands-free. And then you say, are you right-handed or left-handed? And this is where that choice makes it seem like they have full control over this situation. They say, I'm left-handed. You say, okay, great, we wanna use your your weak hand, so we're gonna use your right hand uh, and go ahead and drop your left hand. They leave it out. If they say, I'm right-handed, you say, go ahead, okay, leave your right hand out and, and drop your left. You have them make a fist. And from here, all you have to do is take a little bit of ash and you sprinkle on the back of their hands and rub it in until it vanishes. That's not the magic, it's, uh, but you, you, can, you can play that up. You can, whatever your character, whatever your writing is, but then you say that the ash has gone through their hand and has ended up inside of their palm and they open up and then they have ash inside of their hand. And the reason why this is magical is because you've been stepped away. Even if they remember the actual fact that they made a choice of which hand, it's, it's couldn't, cause it's, it's not on both hands, it's only on the one. And you never touch them because you've made this memory of, hey, you're, you're fucking up, I'm helping you here. They're gonna wipe that. And, and that's a perfect example of, of taking that snapshot as well as using an equivocate and that vague intent on your question uh, to make them uh, follow instructions with you a little bit better. Uh, if we can go ahead to the next slide. Uh, 
real life applications of Equivocate. Um, so honestly, uh, I, Equivocates are best for inferred information. On a job, let's say you notice uh, on Facebook, the big boss had a barbecue. You're, you're doing some big red team thing and you want, you want everyone to, uh, you, you've done a bunch of research, you know the guy that runs the building or whatever, his name's Bob. And you can now weaponize the fact that he had a barbecue that weekend because in your, while you're building rapport with one of your targets, you can say, hey, were you at Bob's barbecue? And they have two realistic responses. They can either say yes or they can say no. And by leveraging this, because of this vague intent, this vague language, you can make it seem like you're either invited but didn't go, which makes that person your equal instantly because you're now, they were invited to the barbecue, so were you. And if they didn't know about it or they didn't go, you can now be their superior. You are now the person that's friends with the big boss and they aren't. And suddenly this relationship dynamic, one, you've inserted yourself close to someone that they're supposed to respect and be under, but also you, you have given yourself a history. You have a background story just from one single piece of information and a vague question. Um, and more often than not though, in magic, uh, you know, you leverage your social position to get away with equivocates. Uh, it allows you to get away with things that might not make sense. But um, when it comes to influencing people's choices in real life using equivocate, people say no and they'll walk away. It's, 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 you can't make realistic situations uh, like by forcing people to, to choose things with equivocate. It's, it's very weird. Um, but you can get away with it, but you have to be a bit of a jerk and you have to write it off as a misunderstanding later and you have to act quickly. Um, an example of doing this with uh, an ambiguous intent is, uh, I don't know how many people know about the trick of asking when your partner says, hey, I'm hungry, you say, and instead of saying, okay, where do you want to go eat? You say, I already know where I want to take you, but you have to guess. And then they do. And instead of being like, oh, you're right, you just take them there because you use this ambiguous intent. They don't know any, any of the information that you know, but it's basically just a big lie to get them to give you more information. Um, and sometimes people don't even know it themselves. Um, and another way I've noticed equivocate in real life is in dark patterns. Uh, a lot of them, if you're not familiar with what a dark pattern is on the internet, uh, is when a UI is, is, creating, is, is creating language or is creating a UI experience um, around sometimes preventing you from doing something or trying to mitigate the amount of people doing a specific action. Like, I don't know if you've ever tried to cancel an Amazon account, but there's like 16 menus to go through and, and it's ridiculous. And that's a dark pattern. Uh, and a quick dark pattern here is uh, don't do not uncheck this box. If you wish to be contacted via about product updates, upgrades, special offers and pricing. Does it make sense? It's confusing, it's vague, it's ambiguous. And it's how they're preventing you from doing an action, which is unsubscribing, uh, which is something that they don't want you to do. Um, and actually even in our game, uh, which if you haven't had a chance to check out the Rogues Village game, go for it. It's beautiful, lots of fun. Um, but we have an equivocate Easter egg hit in there. You're asked uh, what one of your strengths are. And regardless of what you respond with, we're always going to give you the same item because we're either going to bolster your weaknesses or we're going to uh, enhance your strength. And it doesn't matter, but it's an equivocate, but you feel like you have a free choice, but both paths lead to the same road. And once again, it comes down to those constraints. You're figuring out what paths you have available to you and how can you merge them in a direction that you want. Um, and let's go ahead and get to the, uh, the takeaways. Um, oops. Uh, so forces are, are direct decisions that the target has zero control in. Uh, this is good for direct attacks that introduce a specific object. For example, uh, if you're using a switch bag for getting in a piece of hardware, or maybe forcing a value on something like a contest or a lottery. Um, multiple outs are fully free selections that you cannot control. You can't control the amount of constraints. You can accept them, um, but you can be prepared for them. And this is good for having responses for a narrow selection of answers. Uh, for example, a deck of cards is a 52 question uh, object. And, and once you, you can figure out how to mitigate those 52 questions, it becomes a lot easier to deal with. And equivocates, uh, they're for creating ambiguity around definitions, allowing your will to be imposed on a target. Um, equivocates aren't perfect, uh, but it, it allows you to 
enhance your your percentages and is great for warping decisions or you know creating inferred knowledge and the next slide uh this is the defensive takeaways i think this is something that everyone can actually uh gather something from uh, whether you're in security whether in your magic uh, or you're just a plain joe uh, because scams exist everywhere uh, but also please don't ever do this to magicians I beg of you, if I have someone do this to me and I'm doing a magic trick and they, it turns out they saw this talk, I'm gonna be very sad. Um, but forces, if you feel like you didn't have a free choice, uh, attempt to make another one where you can change the rules of the selection. Um, be prepared for an out. Uh, always you know, be ready to, to try to change your choice. If you're at that car lot and they say, here's the green Subaru and you can say, let me look at another green Subaru. And if they're really antsy about that, maybe just leave. You're, you're, you're an adult, go, go buy a car somewhere else. Um, multiple outs, uh, go through the scenarios. What were your actual choices here? Because you might, maybe you're actually in a force, maybe you're in an equivocate, but go through your scenarios and see if it's possible to prepare for each of them. And if that intent on that preparation could be negative to you. Um, and, and like I said, uh, try to change your mind, try to change the rules. If you can change the rules or you can change your mind, you have a lot more freedom, um, but also, you know, chances that, that you can never be a hundred percent sure. So always be able to uh, stand your ground and redact. Uh, and equivocates, uh, when you're given vague decisions, verify the intent of the question and what responses will be used for. Uh, so if you get a weird question and it seems very open-ended and weird, and it's not from someone you trust, uh, clarify on what they want to use the answer for. You don't have to answer questions. You don't have to answer someone you've never met who's asking you in an elevator if you went to Bob's Barbecue. You could say, "What does it matter to you, guy? I don't, I don't know you. Uh, that's my purse. Get out, get away from here." Um, always validate, uh, and that, that's pretty much it. If you can, if you can validate, if you can change your mind, if you can change the rules or how the your what gives you your selection of answers, uh, you'll be safe uh, or safer, as as it were. Um, and I, th I think that's pretty much it. Yeah. I think I'm ready for my, my, my Q and A, Jay. Um, so first up, uh, zero X 90 in your experience, what is the percentage of time that somebody uses some of the defense mechanisms, mechanisms you discussed? Uh, yeah. And when, when it comes to, uh, doing this in a magic scenario, uh, it, it really, it really depends on how you're approaching. Uh, I've noticed that if you treat anything that you're doing in magic like a puzzle, people will shut down and they will they will inherently get defensive and they will not want to interact. Uh, where if you have them select a card, they'll wait till the very end because they don't trust you and it's because you haven't built up rapport. Um, so it, it, it's a case by case scenario. It happens on an individual basis. Um, the, the longer I've been doing magic, though, the less it has happened. And uh, it, it's gotten to the point for me. I remember when I first started almost 10 years ago uh, when I would be doing a trick and then someone would say, oh, I let me let me see those cards. And I'd be like, oh, no. And I would shut down and get all clammy. And uh, and all of a sudden there goes all the magic. But now I, I could prepare. I could have something that I'm preparing for like hours ahead of time. And it took I have every single card exactly where I need it. If someone says, well, whatever, Magic Boy, let me see that deck. I want to shuffle it. And it's not a show where I can tell them to go screw themselves. I'm going to hand them the deck and say, okay, shuffle it. And I will change my entire set just to uh, just to preserve that magic. Um, but as basically, short answer, as you get better, the longer you do it, it happens less and less. It was at a point where it was maybe like one out of ten people. And now... Maybe if I'm performing a lot, it might happen like once a month. But it really depends on like how able you're to disarm your people and how much you can connect with them. Because if you're your, if you're their friend before you start doing magic, they're not going to be a jerk to their friend. Uh, someone asked the question: Are you right-handed or left-handed? <laughs> I am right-handed. Uh, I don't know exactly how. Uh, the, the screen stuff is set up, so it might appear that this is my left hand, um, but I am right-handed. <laughs> and uh, we have a question for you, another one. What kind of ash is it that you're talking about? Something special or just burnt paper? Like, do you make the ash yourself? 
Oh, uh, so actually, this is a classic impromptu effect, and uh, you used to do it originally with like a cigar ash. And the reason why it was neat is because you could just quickly dip your thumb in an ash tray, which is disgusting if it's like public, but you know, it's magic. We do disgusting stuff sometimes. Um, and then you can just sit at a party with your thumb kind of like behind your hand as you're gesticulating and talking to people. And you can go ahead and, and do the effect that way. Um, but basically cigarette ash. Uh, you might potentially want to do this a different way. Um, there are a couple of other effects that have taken this approach um, and they are published and they're still, still currently manufactured. So if you want to go ahead and uh, DM me, I'll actually give you a link to the product. Um, I don't make anything off of it. I just don't want to imply that it uses the same equivocate and stuff because I didn't make this uh, the effect itself. Um, but it's very good and it's modern. You've probably seen it on AGT. It's great. Uh, we got a. <laughs> we have one person that is claiming you as a Fed. So. Uh... Oh, who's claiming me as a Fed? <laughs> uh, what, what's their social security number? <laughs> uh, um, no, I'm I'm not a Fed. Uh, I I have way too much hair. I have so much hair, especially for being a Fed. Uh, that you can't actually tell that I'm wearing like Bose headphones, like I'm full, like the full ear cup. I don't. <laughs> feds don't have this much hair, um, but no, I I'm not a Fed. Uh, I'm I'm a software engineer. I've done some security contract stuff. Uh, ultimately, if if you wanna if you wanna find me on Twitter, DM me and I'll <laughs> send you my page, and you can be very disappointed. <laughs> That's beautiful. Uh, I'm going to wait for one more uh, question that's coming in. Um, I, you know, I think we could probably just field that on the Discord. I'm going to give them 10 seconds to get a 10, 9, 8, 7, 6. I mean, Jade's typing. Oh, okay. All right. Ooh, Angel Rain's typing. <laughs> Maybe if I just keep saying people are typing, I'll get more and more. <laughs> Maybe they'll just start typing and never fill it. Um all right. To what extent admitting a failure can be used as, as an out? So I wouldn't ever consider a, a flat out failure as an out. Um, there have been times where I have set up for an, an effect and you're so far in it. And it. It's like where you're at the table and you need to turn over the card and it has to be your thing. And there have been some times years ago where I've turned that card over and it's the wrong thing and there's just no way of getting back to it. And I say, ladies and gentlemen, this is theater, it's live. I am so sorry. <laughs> I, I, this is a fuck up. Um, and, and every every magician this has happened to. Um, but ideally, like if you, if you have even the smallest window uh, or where you can be clever about something, um, you know, you don't always, you, you rarely have to accept failure. Um, if I'm doing something that is dramatic and there is a lot of intention and emotion behind a certain moment or meaning behind something, uh, artistically, I make the decision to take the fall and the full blame of it. Um, similar to singing a horrible note on, on stage and you just kind of go, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, but I have my artistic integrity and I'm not going to do jazz magic over this to try to recover. <laughs> uh, I think that might be it, um, but thank you, Zero X ninety. Oh wait, sorry, we have one last. This will be the last one, okay? And then we'll then we'll cut it after Ooh. this. We can feel them in the Discord. Um, but this is a good one to end with. Who inspires you the most? Jeez, um, this is this is a really really good question. Um, there, there. I have a couple of answers for this, but um, just to keep this short. I would have to say uh, the late Ricky Jay and the late Johnny Thompson, uh, both different worlds, different styles of performing. Um, but reading R Ricky's uh, depth of knowledge and how much he he is passionate about his craft to, and elevating it to the level of art is beautiful to me. And Johnny Thompson. Uh, being this encyclopedia of magic where he knows just about everything and he's very good and cares about things deeply, but they approach, they approach it differently. Johnny Thompson's about making sure people are entertained and doing it well. And Ricky Jay is about the, uh, you know, the, the total experience of theater. 
and he he sees this theater that he alone sees in his head. It's, it's just him, and he has this idea of what makes it perfect, and he's very aggressive about it, and I love it. Um, sorry, I lied to you. Last one. Uh, <laughs> uh, but AOD wants you to speak to the idea that a magician can sneak out of a failure because that's the audience, or the audience doesn't know exactly what's supposed to happen. Yeah, exactly. Um, don't uh, don't run when no one's chasing you. If if I pull out a a card and it's like the reveal, and I know it's not it, I I figured it out that is not it. Um, you know, you can you can attempt to backtrack. You can maybe uh, like. There are there are effects. There's a thing called an invisible deck. It's wonderful, and it allows you basically to to have to summon any card essentially. And for example, if you ever screw up so badly that it's, it's irredeemable, you can keep something like that on your person and just be like, "Well, actually, I did this," and then you did this whole other effect. You can always move on to something else. No one knows that you're about to have the card come to the top of the deck 47 times in a row. Maybe on the 22nd one, it, you, you, you screw it up, and, and you can just move into something else. You can just make a joke about it and be like, oh, I guess it died after 21, and move on. And it depends on your, your personality. And honestly, the calmer you are, the, the more ready you are to accept something getting screwed up and just moving on with it, people will never remember it. People seldom... I, I have I have come off of uh, so many performances where I screwed one thing up and I had to recover like that, and it, it affects me to the point where I'm I become so upset like I, I like I need like hours by myself to like think about how I'm such an idiot and I screwed something up, and I have never had a single person ever pointed out, and even professional magicians I'm like yeah but I did this and I screwed this thing up and they're like oh I, I thought you were just going into this effect that way. I had no clue. No, no one cares. No one's chasing you. Um, yeah. Awesome. Uh, that will conclude our Q and a portion for this talk. Thank you. Uh, for everything. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs>